questions. Um, I'm a plant biologist in the biology department and my interest is in producing sustainable biofuels from um, the residues of agriculture. So we're living at a really interesting juncture in, in the history of our species. So we're getting to a point due to the size of the human population and increasing patterns of consumption where we're getting close to the holding capacity of the planet, its ability to supply what we need. And John Beddington pointed out a few years ago now that some of the biggest challenges that we face are shown here. So by 2030, it's estimated that there'll be an increase in energy demand globally of 50%, food demand of 50%, and fresh water demand of 30%. Now, producing and delivering those is a massive challenge to us, but that's made much worse in the face of what we know about climate change. So as the climate becomes more unpredictable, then agricultural yields become more unpredictable. And in addition, providing this additional um, energy to the world is a, a real, really tricky matter because most of it is produced currently from fossil fuels. And as we know, fossil fuels are one of the biggest sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions on the planet at the moment and play a big part in what we know about the human contribution to global warming. And governments around the world are now committed to reducing carbon emissions um, all over the place. That then is tricky if we're going to increase the amount of energy produced that we produce and use. We've got to do that in a way that doesn't generate more greenhouse gases. So we can make electricity from a range of renewables like solar, um, geothermal, nuclear. We can make electricity with those, but what we can't do is provide the liquid transportation fuels that our logistics systems are dependent on. Now, about the only way that we can produce those liquid transportation fuels in a carbon, or in at least a potentially carbon neutral fashion, is through the use of biofuels. So those are fuels that are produced from crops, from agricultural products, where the carbon that you emit when you combust those fuels is balanced by the carbon fixed by the plant in producing those materials in the first place. The danger is, so currently we make biofuels using the same bits of the crops that we use for food. So in this case, here we've got cereal, and we would make the biofuels from the starch in the grain. And we would use that starch by depolymerizing it. So starch is a polymer of glucose. If we depolymerize that, we can make glucose, which we can ferment to make alcohols. Now, where we're, what we're interested in is that these structural um, components of the plant, the stems, and also the husks around the grains here, those are made also mostly of polysaccharides, so polymers of sugars. And we can convert those polymers into simple sugars that we can ferment and make, bi make biofuels from as well. And if we do that, that takes away the potential stress that we would impose on world food security if we continue to make biofuels from the food parts of the crops. So the route by which we do that is shown on this slide. The ones in orange are what we call first generation biofuels. They're the ones we make at the moment. And they're either made by fermenting sugar from sugar cane or sugar beet, or, as I said, from uh, hydrolyzing starch down to its component glucose units, fermenting that and distilling that. These are things we've been doing for thousands of years for various reasons. If we want to move to what we call these second generation biofuels from woody plant materials, such as straw, then the route is very similar, but we have to do a lot more work at this end in order to get the sugars out of the material. And that's because those materials are very difficult to digest. The result of that is that the biofuels produced by this route, although very sustainable, are economically not competitive either with first generation biofuels or with fossil fuel derived liquid transportation fuels. So what we're interested in is what makes these materials so hard to digest and what can we do about that? <coughs> this picture illustrates the, um, the indigestibility, if you like, of woody materials. So this is what remains of the Mary Rose after 500 years on the bottom of the Solent. This bit here lay in silts, trapped in silts for most of that period, and it comes out almost 
perfectly preserved. So the, the woody materials there have not broken down at all. 500 years and they're still there. The interesting question from our perspective is what happened to the other half of the Mary Rose? And it turns out it was mostly eaten by these animals. They're nowhere near this big. This is an EM <laughs> image of the head of an animal that we call Gribble, the colloquial name is Gribble, and these are small crustaceans that live on a diet of wood. They burrow into the wood, and we know from looking at the edges of the Mary Rose that they ate all the other bits that aren't there, and they eat most of the wood that gets into the um, coastal areas of, uh, around the UK, at least. And so we've been studying these animals to try and understand how they digest wood, and they're unusual. So most animals that digest wood do it using... Um, help from microbes that live in their digestive system. But these ones, it turns out, have a sterile digestive system and do it just with their own enzymes. We've been studying those enzymes and we're working with um, enzyme companies to look at how we can translate what we learn from this animal into producing those sugars from woody materials more effectively. Now, I said I was a plant scientist and that wasn't a plant that we were working on there. The other thing that we do in our group is we study how plants make these woody materials that make up the stems. And we study the composition. So here's a, an image of what, what these are, are made up of. These are fibre composite materials. The fibres are cellulose. Those are polymers of glucose, just like starch, but much harder. They're crystalline, and very difficult to digest. And they're also wrapped up with all these other polymers that hold them together as a composite. And that makes this material very hard to digest. So we're studying the genes that are involved in making these materials and looking for ones that we can make use of to produce plants that have more digestible stems. The big danger there is if you get this wrong, you might have stems that can't stand up anymore. So we're very <laughs> cognizant of that. But our aim is to use this approach through plant breeding to produce sugars more easily from these materials. So, one of our favourite crops for doing this at the moment is rice. Rice is one of the biggest crops grown in the world. And our interest in rice developed from a visit we had to Vietnam um, a few years ago in which we started collaborating with Vietnamese scientists in this area. And the thing that really caught our attention when we went over to Vietnam to discuss biofuels was that they burn an awful lot of straw over there. So, it says stubble just because it rhymes with gribble, but um, it's mostly straw and husks that are burnt. And Vietnam's not alone in this. Any of the places that grow, a lot, that grow rice in the world burn most of the straw. And the reason for doing that is that rice straw is particularly hard to digest, so it's very hard to find other uses for it. And they produce several crops a year and have to replant the fields very rapidly. So that burning, that's an awful lot. So that's about three times as much straw as we produce in total in the UK being burnt just in Vietnam. That's hundreds of millions of tonnes globally. And that causes severe air, pollu air pollution, lots of premature deaths, inhibits crop growth from shading and from ozone production, and has a big effect in terms of um, uh, global warming because of the black carbon that gets into the atmosphere. So we see this as a really good opportunity of somewhere where we could make use of that straw to make biofuels and help eliminate that problem with air pollution. So what we're doing with our Vietnamese colleagues is we're, um, we've put together a panel of, of, of diverse rice varieties that are used in breeding programs in Vietnam. And what we've been doing is looking at the inheritance in this group of uh, rice varieties of both the digestibility of the straw and differences in their gene sequences. So we sequence the genomes and identify differences and look at how the plants, um, look at the um, inheritance of digestibility and gene sequences. This graph shows the range of digestibility in these rice varieties in the straw and it's very large. There's, there's more than a threefold uh, difference from the least to the most digestible ones. And when we look for um, the inheritance of digestibility characteristics and differences in gene sequences, what we can do is produce a plot like this, which we call a Manhattan plot. And where you see these peaks coming over this red line, these are peaks of association between the inheritance of a gene difference and a difference in digestibility. And they tell you where there are hot spots in the rice genome sequence 
where there are genes that control digestibility. Here's data from two different years of growth of the same panel, and where we see these red dotted lines, this indicates regions where we see this over more than one growth season, and that tells us that the peaks of association here are very robust to environmental conditions, and those are the ones that we can use best in breeding programs. So we're identifying the genes that are responsible for these um, differences in digestibility. That's feeding into our fundamental knowledge about um, the uh, composition of, of, of the woody materials of plants and what makes them digestible. But we can also use this information in breeding programs to improve the digestibility of that straw. And the ultimate aim is for us to see a lot more of that straw going into the production of biofuels. That would have a double benefit. One, reducing air pollution, as we saw earlier and heard a lot from Ali's talk. Um, and the other thing is, by producing biofuels, you also then displace the use of fossil fuels. So you get, a, if you like, a double benefit in terms of the environment from doing that. The other point is that more digestible straw is also very beneficial for food production. So if you have more digestible straw, it has better value for animal feed. And so you can see that the work that we're doing could eventually lead to improvements in food security as well. So what we ideally want to see is the research we're doing helping towards realising some of these challenges associated with the increased demand for energy and food on the planet. And that's it. <laughs>